Welcome to Research Bites with LearnEd CPD, where we break down educational research into easy to digest bite-sized chunks. My name is Lucinda Pohl, and today I will be talking about Sweller's cognitive load theory. This builds on my previous research bite of working memory, so it might be worth taking a quick look at that video if you don't know much about working memory before you watch this one. Sweller has been developing his cognitive load theory for a long time, since, well, 1988, and in this research bite we are going to consider what he has to say from a chapter called Cognitive Load Theory, Recent Theoretical Advance, published in 2010. Essentially, cognitive load tells us about how we acquire information or knowledge. The limitations on this as a consequence of how much information our brains can deal with at any one time and the implications that has for how we present information to learners. So Ella has five principles about knowledge and learning that must be understood and followed in order for optimal learning to take place. But before we start, it's probably worth considering a few key concepts. Firstly, Sweller uses the concepts of biological primary and secondary knowledge. The idea that there are two types of knowledge, biological primary knowledge, which is knowledge that we gain just because we're part of society, such as a language or recognising faces, and biological secondary knowledge, which is more abstract information that has to be explicitly passed from one person to the next. This is mostly done nowadays through formal education and as a consequence is what we're interested in when we talk about cognitive load. Acquisition of secondary biological knowledge is usually conscious and requires effort. Psychologists, and this includes Sweller, also describe knowledge as being organised into a schema. The best way to think about these schemas is perhaps as adaptive blueprints. We have a schema of a concept, and OK, I'm going to use the restaurant example like most psychologists. We have a schema of a restaurant that is built up over many visits to restaurants. Each time I visit a restaurant, I add a little bit more information about how restaurants might operate to my schema, broadening and or deepening my understanding of a restaurant. For example, if I have been to various pizza restaurants, I may assume that all restaurants require to sit at a table until a waiter comes to take your order. But then I go to a fast food restaurant and I can't see any waiters. So I learn that in some restaurants, you go to the counter to order. Which brings me to the final point. My first restaurant trip, I am a novice and perhaps I am helped by an older, wiser adult who explains how to order, or I watch my parents ordering for me. Eventually, after many years of restaurant visits, I know that if I want fast food, I will need to go to the counter. If I go to a pub, I will need to ask where to order. And if I go to fancy restaurants from handed a menu, I will have table service. And in a new restaurant, I'll quickly work out what I'm supposed to do. Finally, a really quick recap of working memory and long-term memory. Working memory is essentially a form of short term memory with a duration of 10 to 30 seconds that can hold a very limited amount of information. This is usually thought of as Miller's magic number after George Miller, whose research suggested that adults can store between five and nine items in their short term memory or seven plus or minus two. But this is less if we are actively processing the information, as we will see. It is where we combine new information with information from long-term memory to work out what is going on in the world around us. And it's vital to understanding cognitive load theory. Long-term memory refers to anything that is stored for more than 30 seconds, and it theoretically has in infinite capacity and it holds information for a lifetime. So, so as five principles. Sweller proposes that these five key principles all have implications for knowledge acquisition for novice learners and affect cognitive load. So we will have a quick look at each of these and the implications for the classroom. So the first one, long-term memory and the information store principle. This basically states that the long-term memory holds a variety of information, not just facts and episodes of our lives, but problem-solving strategies. And as already mentioned, is an, an immeasurably large store. Schema theory and the borrowing and reorganization principle. This is the idea that everything we know comes from others. Just as this video is about cognitive load, you are learning from me and I am learning from Swella and the others that I've read. But when we borrow information from others, we reorganize it in accordance with our own schemas so that things I know about I might strengthen in this video and things I know less about I might flatten, therefore changing the information slightly as I pass it on. But in the process, I am making the information I'm learning fit with my schemas so that information is now grouped into chunks. During the learning process, these schemas become easy to access and automatic. And this is important for reducing cognitive load as we move from novice to expert. 
In the classroom, this suggests that learning is a process of constructing new knowledge through listening to, watching, copying others and reading. And our instructional process should give opportunity for learners to do all of these things. Problem solving and the randomness as genesis principle. This is the idea that when there is no information available, I have to figure out the answer to a problem through experimentation. If some knowledge is available, I might prioritize possible solutions, but if no information is available, then I will try things one by one, each time altering my current store of knowledge or schema. This is a slow and laborious process and a slow and laborious way to learn and has implications for learning theories such as discovery learning. Number four, working, novice working memory and the narrow limits of change principle. As a consequence of random genesis, no large and fast alterations to memory can be made. This is a good thing because a big sweeping change to knowledge to a knowledge store might be fatal. Perhaps imagine a filing cabinet of information. You are better to add and remove files one at a time than empty out the whole lot, add a whole bunch of new stuff and then try to reorganize it. Working memory is the evolutionary development, so Sweller argues, that stops sweeping change and ensures that changes to long-term memory are small and incremental. The narrow limits of change principle suggest that information must be carefully structured to ensure that working memory is not overloaded and that schemes are effectively constructed and transferred to long-term memory. Teaching and learning should take into account, therefore, that we can only learn slowly, a little at a time. Finally, principle five, expert working memory and the environment organising and linking principle. This principle assumes that there are differences between a novice and an expert, a learner and a teacher in the classroom context. It assumes that experts have large detail schemas that can be downloaded as one chunk. Because the expert schemas are more complex, they can have more complex interactions with the environment. Finally, this principle requires that the preceding principles are also true. In the classroom, our aim is to move students from using working memory with limited duration and capacity to using long-term memory with unlimited duration and capacity as they move from novice to expert. So I will read this quote out, but I suggest that you just have a quick pause of the video and think about how this quote links all the five principles that I have just outlined. The primary purpose of cognitive load theory has been to indicate how to present novel information structured according to the narrow limits of change principle. That is to say, we can only change our schemas a little at a time to reduce unnecessary working memory load and facilitate change in long term memory. In turn, changes in long term memory permit complex actions through the environment organizing and link linking principle, thus moving from novice to expert and once again reducing the cognitive load as we deepen and broaden our understanding of a subject. So cognitive load. When does cognitive load become too great? When we talk about working memory, we suggest that the standard capacity was Miller's magic number seven plus or minus two. However, there is research to suggest that while this is the case for information in isolation, when you get interactivity, this number reduces to something like four chunks of information. So imagine I have to remember a string of numbers. On average, I could remember seven, but if I'm asked not only to remember some numbers, but then do some arithmetic, then I'm likely to only remember and process four chunks at a time. This has some interesting implications and explains why there is a difference between novices and experts, or say why it might be helpful for children to memorise their timetables, but perhaps that's a debate for another time. The other thing that teachers need to know is that there are three key types of cognitive load, intrinsic, extrinsic and germane. Intrinsic cognitive load is basically the stuff that you want the pupils to actually learn, and it's difficulty. Extrinsic load is the stuff that might be important to getting the task done, but it's not what we want the student to actually learn. And germane cognitive load is the effort required to transfer the information from working memory to long term memory. This is reduced if there are already schema or if that schema are more complex. So what does this mean for classroom practice? It actually has pretty big ramifications. If we're aiming for long-term memory change and development of complex schemas so that people can move from novice to experts, we need to reduce extrinsic cognitive load because learning happens slowly one bit at a time. So chalk and talk lessons throwing hundreds of facts at pupils will result in little change. When we reduce extrinsic cognitive load, we free up working memory for either intrinsic or germane cognitive load, which should enhance learning, schema acquisition and building. So when you are planning a lesson, think about how you design it to reduce cognitive load. 
So to finish, here are 10 things that you can do to reduce cognitive load. One, make connections. Make connections between schema that pupils already have and are likely to need to use during the lesson. Two, use routines so that they don't have to follow instructions that are new and they have to think about. Three, break things down to make them really, really simple um, so that you are literally only processing four things at once. Give students enough time to process. Don't rush through things from one thing to another because it will overload the working memory. Label diagrams effectively. So make sure that labels are on the same slide as the diagram or on the same page as the diagram and make that sure that labels don't use keys like A, B, C and then the labels down the side actually just label diagrams with um, direct labels. Keep it simple. So don't put extraneous information onto a PowerPoint that you don't actually need. Just put the information that is relevant to keep pupils focused on um, the key things. Keep instructions visible so pupils don't have to hold instructions in their head, either print them out or put them on the board. Think about your environment and how much information there is in environment and if it's overloading some pupils. Think about the language that you use, particularly if you teach a subject that uses a lot of subject specific vocabulary that pupils may not be confident using yet. When you're using new vocabulary, repeat definitions, use other words that you can keep, keep the language as simple as possible. And finally, be mindful about what else pupils might be bringing to the classroom. So if they've just come in from break, there may be issues that have happened at break that are using up working memory space. I hope that you found this video useful. Don't forget to sign up to our mailing list. The link is below to be the first to get your hands on our LearnEd Research Bytes blogs and new courses. And of course, you can visit the LearnEd website to find out more about our free and paid for professional development courses. Thank you and take care.